my team manager for Jacksonville, North Carolina. And I'm Mark Spryberry. I'm a director for emergency management. So, it's, seriously, though. Did I pronounce your name right? Spryberry. 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 It's a common name around here. I'm sure you heard it a lot. Actually, there's a Spryberry High School. There's a Spryberry's World Famous Barbecue. It's all in Georgia, though. And so it's an old name down in the Georgia, Alabama way. But be that as it may, I'm here to talk to you about strike teams. And I, I like to go bottom line up front, what we're about here, because I got some slides I'm going to show you. But the, the end objective here is to get volunteers from local municipalities and counties that are skilled in, in IT and GIS that are willing to go to their brother and brother counties and municipalities to assist them during uh, disaster events. We will also request that you come to the State Emergency Management the Emergency Operations Center or to one of the state's regional coordination centers, of which there's three, one in Hickory, one in Butner, and one in uh, Kinston. And the reason for that is because most counties and cities, as you know, they don't have a whole lot of IT staff. They don't have a, you know, some more than others. They don't have a whole lot of GIS staff. But if you think about a, a rural county, you know, say like Jones County. Anybody here from Jones County? I can't imagine that they would have a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of IT and GIS expertise on staff. So they would burn out pretty quick. So it would be good to have somebody come in so they could rotate shifts with them depending on how big the disaster is. I can tell you at the state EOC and our regional coordination centers, when there's a disaster, I don't have a very big IT staff and they get burned out pretty quick. Now we can rely on other state agencies, but we, we tend to find, based on our experience with counties and, and municipalities, that we can depend on them a lot better than other state agencies. So anyway, I'm going to run through some stuff to give you some context of what emergency management does. A lot of you probably already know that. Anyway, I'm the director of emergency management. I've been there since the 20th of February of this year. And um, before that, I was the deputy director and the operations chief since 2005. And then before that, I was in the Marine Corps and the Army National Guard as a field artillery and infantry officer. So here we go, and we'll get started. And I just hit the wrong button. Perfect. So we'll do like that. There we go. As you know, in North Carolina, we have all kinds of different incidents, uh, from snow to tornadoes to uh, the hurricanes. Our biggest risk in North Carolina is flooding caused by hurricanes. I'm going to tell you that uh, this past week has really showed us that we need to be ready for anything with that F5 tornado. Hurricane Sandy, uh, we hosted a hurricane conference at East Carolina University yesterday. Had over 200 people there. How many people do y'all have here today? It looks like a pretty good crowd. Well, so three-something? So that's great. So, uh, but we had the... Uh, emergency preparedness officer uh, from the Coast Guard for Sector New York who was there during Hurricane Sandy. She had a presentation, unbelievable. You know, we knew about the damages, but she had pictures that she took from her iPhone, and uh, incredible. More North Carolina incidents, uh, you know, you can see where um, right here we had a, a building collapse in Raleigh. Uh, you know, we've had pandemic uh, flu, we've had uh, wildfires, uh, train wrecks, all that stuff. So we have all that stuff. We've got to be prepared from everything from search and rescue to help communities recover. And the thing I want to just really show here and what I'm asking y'all to be uh, available for is to provide incident management and to supplement local government resources. The motto that I have for my folks is I tell them to ask themselves every day, what have you done for the counties today? Because they're our biggest customers. I'm not throwing the cities out. Okay, I know you work for city. Like <laughs> so, but we can only deal with counties, the 100 counties plus the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation. And so, um, and then the counties deal with the municipalities. That's how resource requests roll up. We'll talk about that. 
It's necessary. It needs to be a priority for all government uh, levels. And I can tell you that we do stuff. We have helicopter rescue. Um, we have uh, hazmat teams. Um, you know, when uh, 22,000 pounds of dynamite spills on I-85, we go out and do that. People remember that stuff. Uh, we just, you know, a few months back, there were three school buses colliding. Uh, in April 2011, 28 tornadoes. Uh, I think you were involved with that, Chris. Uh, Hurricane Sandy, Irene Floyd. Terrorist attacks. I mean, good Lord, we saw what happened in London yesterday. Some crazy maniacs with uh, cleavers and, and knives. And, and we have to be ready for that. And so we in emergency management in North Carolina are also responsible for homeland security. We work very closely with the National Guard and the State Bureau of Investigation. Hurricane Katrina, uh, we sent folks down there. We sent a mobile hospital and all kinds of folks. What do we add to the state? Hazard Risk Management Program, team approach, local, regional, state, federal, and non-governmental partners, a network of resources, strategic and tactical plans. We have a 24-hour operations center in our state EOC. It's operational. Um, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You may or may not have known that, but what happens is if there's a big hazmat incident on 95, they'll call us. If there is somebody that needs to be rescued by helicopter, they'll call us. There's also the statewide transportation operations center with DOT. It's a room about the size of a basketball court. You saw it. It's uh, all these screens. We have eyes out on the battlefield. That's what I call it. We can look at incidents, we can look at evacuations, things like that. The Guard has a Joint Operations Center or the job, and they have another name for it too, but I won't share it with you. And so, uh, but that's co-located with us, and we also have the Highway Patrol Troop C Communications Center. All right, uh, we have recovery management, that's the grind of what we do, it takes a long time to recover, and uh, we are the agency in the Department of Public Safety that controls all other state agencies when we do disaster response. Right now, I'm the director of emergency management. When we become activated uh, for disaster response, I become the state emergency response team leader. It's pretty interesting because all of the uh, leaders of state agencies, they have, they have to do what I ask them to do. But it's more of a partnership. It's not like I'm going to be, do this or else. We all work together. We do common sense exercise all the time. Peer network, we train, we train so many people. Uh, I guess uh, last year we trained 5,700 folks. We're going to train you guys too. Um, we conduct search and rescue during our rain. We sent out our swift water rescue folks and helicopters. We rescued 100 folks. You know, there's folks that go up in the mountains and they do what they call rock jumping. And uh, they'll go by themselves with no cell phone and get way up high and jump from rock to rock. And they'll fall and hurt themselves and expect somebody to come rescue them. And we do because they're people, but you know, you wonder what kind of sense these people have, you know. Um, we also uh, handle hazard material calls, and there's 83 requests for assistance in 2011. All disasters aren't equal. Some are small, some are large. Type 1, small, type 2, bigger, type 3, the biggest. We are nationally accredited. Um, we became uh, nationally accredited in 2005. It's called the Emergency Management Accreditation Program. We're very proud of it. Um, one of the first things that happened after I became the uh, director in March is that the team came for reaccreditation. So I can tell you the old heart was pumping there, but we had been working pretty hard for some time to ensure that we would do well. And um, there's 54 standards that you're evaluated on, and um, we passed all 54 standards on the first try with no deficiency. So I'm very proud of that. And good report to go to the governor in my first full month as the new director. It's just still a provision, right? You know, I'm in, an, I'm in what they call an appointed position. And so uh, I have no right. So you work so, for the pleasure. For the pleasure, and, um, but I'm an apolitical person. Um, you know, I don't care what party. That's that's not what I'm into. What I'm into is public safety, and 
doing what we can do for the people. And notice I'm not saying citizens, I say people. Because there's people here that are prob they're un not probably, we know there's undocumented um, folks that are here, but they're people too. And so, you know, we are going to try our best to make sure they're safe. There's people traveling through our state, they might be a Yankee. We're going to make sure. <laughs> and so, uh, and uh, we're going to take care of the pets that are here. And uh, by the way, that's both a federal and a state law. And we have roughly 40 uh, companion animal mobile equipment trailers that have 50 cages in each one, along with bowls and poop scoopers and the whole works. And so, if me and I have my pets and I evacuate and go to a shelter, we can pull this uh, trailer right up next to it. And it makes me it makes me evacuate because I don't want to leave my pet behind and I don't want to stay in a car somewhere with a pet, you know. I mean, so we've got a lot of capability. Um, so anyway, we're accredited. We're, we think we're a national leader. And, and what we're talking about here today really is mutual aid. Because if you're going to do this, what it means is you're volunteering to help your brother and sister counties, or whatever you want to call them, it, your sister counties, brother counties, whatever. But um, that's what makes North Carolina a resilient, strong state because we work together. Now, what's so awesome and why I'm so excited about starting this program is because you all, I mean, how many, 350 people, 400, who knows? I mean, a lot of people, I was down there listening to everybody go for those prizes. Um, <laughs> it's the only time we have everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Believe meals, me. Meals and prizes. Hey, and beer. And beer. I'm, I, you know, 25 years in the military. This I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it's hard to, to get consensus on many things. But when... Yes, and so I got it. But what this is, what's so great about this is, is that not, you are, are developing relationships here. And that's what, make, that's what makes emergency management boom or bust. If you don't have a good relationship, then, and it's like any other business, IT's the same way. I mean, so I would tell you that my vision would be is that you know of a county that needs help and you know that person because of your association with them and you've met them and you've been friends with them for however many years in Nicolajiza and um, and so you can go help out these smaller counties. You know, I'm guessing that the bigger counties, they've got a pretty robust staff. I mean, I'm just guessing, but they could probably use some help too. And so everybody can always use some extra GIS and IT help. I know that we could in the state DOC. And so that's kind of my vision is that when we have a big storm like an Isabel or Floyd or heaven forbid a big Sandy come our way. And so these people are operating two 12 hour shifts, you know. And so they can't do it just forever and ever. They got to have somebody come in and spot them a little bit. And so I'm not saying that you would go in and work a 12 hour shift. I will tell you, even at the state EOC during a big event, well, we, we do have 12 on, 12 off, but typically at nighttime, things slow down even in a big event. And so what we do is it's not staffed so, so, uh, with so many people at night because there's just not that many requests coming in. Okay. Uh, you know, search and rescue training, and you'd be pleased to know perhaps that we have an outstanding little aquatic rescue team with three different types of helicopters. That's how we're uh, organized, you know, it's ICS, I'm right there, and so we have a, a good a good group of folks. Now, we're divided into three um, branches, east, central, and western branch, and um, there's our office right there in Kinston, there's one up there in Butner, and there's in Conover, but I just say here because some people say, where the heck where did they come from? I didn't call them. Well, do you know where the uh, ALE is? Right there. It's on my top four. And the Highway Patrol used to be there, but they moved. Or I'm not sure. I don't know if they moved or if it was just a T1 line that moved. <laughs> and so 
<laughs> anyway, they were paying for the T1 line, but I'm also the budget director. Uh, so, so I know a little bit about the cost of the T1 line. I know what it does. But, um, yes. Yes. And so um, that's how we're organized. And so uh, here's the state emergency response team. And so we have all these uh, different state agencies, and we call those uh, volunteers uh, active during disaster, volunteer organizations active during disaster. We have awesome volunteers, and so uh, we love them. They're what make us successful, to be honest with you. Because, you know, when you look at these folks, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, DOT, they have a lot. National Guard has a lot. Really, it's the volunteers that make the disaster response. That's where I work, and um, I love that picture because if you see where we're at, your statue on the right. That's uh, <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so the address is 1636 Gold Star Road. And so, what does 1636 mean? Well, that's when the uh, the National Guard started. 1636. So, Gold Star is, you know, when somebody has a loved one that, that gets killed in action, they, they put a Gold Star in there. And so, it's pretty significant. And that guy is what they call the Minute Man. Also. And so, uh, but that's, let me tell you something. If you saw where we worked before, we worked in the basement of the downtown Department of Administration building where the uh, Pipes in the bathrooms would break upstairs. We're down in the basement. We'll let your imagination roll with it. And so, uh, also a lot of mold down there. We could do the mission, but not very nice. And so, uh, Chris, I know some of y'all have seen this new place. Um, we're, oops, well, this is the big room right there. But uh, back up, my wife is up here. She works, she is the executive assistant for the adjutant. General, who I was a major, we were both a major with together at the brigade combat team together. So I've known him forever. And so uh, it's a small world. So anyway, uh, we activated for the Democratic National Convention. And so uh, this is what they call the command table. This is where I'll be sitting when we have a big event. That's 8 feet by 13 feet, four 65 inch monitors. And so uh, FEMA guy right there. It's a big room. You can see a lot of people. And um, it's just a lot better and no mold. <laughs> okay. And so what happened during the Democratic National Convention is they four deployed me, since I was the operations chief at that time, down to the Charlotte uh, Police, Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Command Center. And so we ate sandwiches three meals a day. I was so glad when it was over. But um, anyway, uh, that was a good, a good uh, mission for us there, doing a weather briefing right there. We talked about hazards. Let me tell you something. We, we have a, a drought hazard. Y'all remember when we had the drought. Well, we're just now, I mean, still, there are some counties in eastern North Carolina that are called abnormally dry. And so I had to write a drought plan. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, so I'm scratching my head. Well, what you do is you sort of you find out how water is distributed. And so let me tell you, in this state, I don't know how it is in other state, it's a goat rope. Because what they do is they they're, they're pipelines and then they add them on and it's just kind of helter skelter, you know. It's kind of like some wire wiring diagrams that you see. Or, well, I'm sure that happens in IT when people do add-ons and add-ons and add-ons. Same thing with water and then some people get they take the water and they want to keep it for themselves and so but anyway we did that we also y'all remember the Deepwater Horizon incident I had a tactical response plan in case tar balls showed up on the beaches and so interestingly enough the oil that came from that rig it has a DNA to it so you can take it and test it and you can determine whether or not it came from that rig you do so, but we do all kinds of stuff. We do training and exercise all the time. We're responsible for the safety of all fixed nuclear uh, facilities. 
of which there are four that affect the state of North Carolina, Catawba, McGuire, McGuire, Harris, and Brunswick. And so, uh, you know, we have two major federally evaluated exercises twice a year. Um, they have off scenarios, the counties are always busy. Hazardous materials, all the time training, that's a good thing because of all the chemicals, the nasty stuff that moves across our highways, our waterways, and our uh, railroads. There's our Hilo Aquatic training. I've actually hung off the, uh, they took me in a Black Hawk, and they picked me up, and I had just had breakfast. And so, I'm at the bottom of this cable, and so um, I had grits, sausage, and good old breakfast. And so, they lift me up, and for whatever reason, I started spinning. And so, I spin, I mean, I've been to Carowinds and Bush Garden and stuff. It was way faster than that. And so uh, I'm sitting there going, whoa, whoa, like that. And when you're, when you're being rescued, there's what they call a rescue technician. Well, I weigh 225 pounds, well, maybe a little more. And so <laughs> anyway, so I got this little rescue technician. He's probably 140 pounds soaking wet. And so he's strapped into me. He's watching me. I, you know, his little head like right here, and I, I about let him have it. But Black Hawk got up over the trees, and we're in the mountains, and about like that, and they told us to do it. We had a helmet on, I could hear what they say, put your arms out and clean yourself out. So it was like I was Superman, just riding above the trees. I only did that one time. <laughs> My wife doesn't want to do that kind of stuff anymore. More training, okay, earthquake exercise. We have buses. There's actually one here in Wilmington that you can put people on and evacuate them, and uh, you can feed them oxygen. I mean, they've got the whole McGill on there. And uh, we have resources, um, response and recovery. Anybody near Greensboro remember when the tank farm caught on fire? And uh, we sent resources to that. Um, that's the team. Now, here's a guy. You're in the mountains, a scenic area come up and there's a there's a rail, okay? And you can look at it, it's beautiful, okay, good. And so after you take pictures and you walk away from it, no, he climbs over the rail. He's from New York, by the way. So <laughs> anybody here from New York? <laughs> and so, uh, well, naturally, he falls. And so uh, he landed in the top of one of those trees, or that tree right there. That's an actual picture of him being rescued. That picture was taken from a news helicopter. And so, uh, lucky for him, because if he hadn't hit that tree, it was 700 feet down on the side of the mountain. And so, uh, in my vernacular, I call those people nimrods. And so, why would you climb? There's a reason for the rail, right? As a college student, I talked to you about the Madison County Boat Snowboat Spread. There's uh, swift water boats during Hurricane Irene. I mean, these guys are trained, they know what they're doing. There's a train derailment. You know, the uh, all emergencies begin and end at the local level. So just what happens? Citizen calls 911. Um, local gets dispatched. If that doesn't work, then uh, they call us and we send resources. And then if it's a big disaster, um, we can get other counties to pitch in or the federal government. There's a local EOC. You notice the local EOC is typically a lot smaller. And you have many different disciplines in there. This is what I wanted to talk to you about. Okay? How much time do I have? Okay. So what we're doing is we'd like to handle or create two types of strike teams. And this is not where you have like a gun or something. Swash blood, buckling swords and everything. Strike team sounds pretty wild, you know. But what it means is, is that you have the capability that, you know, if you're a volunteer and if you've been trained, then we want you to go to the county that calls for you. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and, and tell you some kind of a, a story that, you know, if you go, that likely there's going to be the Riverside Hilton. You know, what's, what you're going to have to do is, you know, you're going to have to understand that where you're going, they've experienced a disaster event. And so, like as not, you know, the conditions, it's, it's going to be the 
disastrous. And so uh, you might not have the best place to stay. And so, uh, but we have locals that do other types of things. They serve on what we call incident management teams. And, um, and they go, they do this routinely. And so the kind of equipment that you would take with you is a laptop, a printer, and a MiFi device. If you're a GIS person, a vehicle, a laptop, printer, plotter, and my MiFi device. And so we have like a, a team lead, one person who's like the most experienced or the leader, and then two people that work for them. Now, I got to tell you, even with our incident management teams, we have persons that are identified as the lead. Really what that means is that's the guy that has to, if somebody comes to, you know, they have to answer the questions, they have to handle the big problems and stuff like that. It isn't like the military. I mean, we just work together, that's the way that it is. And so, um, you know, where I work, people call me Mike. It's not Director Sprayberry or Mr. Sprayberry, it's just Mike. And so, you know, I keep telling people that it isn't the military. And even though I was in the military, I don't want to run like a military organization. We're all mature adults. We like to think that anyway. Or at least some of us are mature. <laughs> so, so, anyway, so there you have it. So, what are the qualifications that we want? Well, first of all, I don't want to take anybody that you guys haven't said as a group that, yeah, we think these guys are somebody that could represent Nickel Jesus. And so, you know, I'm not going to, you know, and, and what standards those are, that's internal to you guys. And, and believe me, I, I would say that, that most people that work and survive in government, you know, in IT and GIS, my guess is you are pretty much all of you know what the heck you're doing. I mean, or else you wouldn't be here. I mean, I mean that's a, probably a generalization, but uh, we like to think that we know what we're doing, right? Give me the drinking chicken if you agree. Yeah. So you know what you're doing, but again, you know, it's important to me that I know that uh, that somebody in Nickel Jesus, the whatever committee that you have, says, yeah, these guys, they're ready. All right, then there's four courses, an introduction to the National Incident Management System, an introduction to the National Response Framework, an introduction to the Incident Command System, and the ICS, that's the Incident Command System for Single Resources and Incident, incident Action Incidents. Those four courses are online. They take about two hours each. You go to www.fema.gov and um, you go in there and you can take them, you can get a certificate and all the rest of it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a document that uh, Chris will upload to your website at the place where you volunteer to become a strike team member and you will be able to see how to access um, those courses. I've taken them all. It's a requirement for all responders, firemen, National Guard guys, whoever. We think that's pretty important to do that so you understand how we all work together. And so the, the optional piece, but I still think is very good, is incident command system for expanding incidents. And that sort of gives you a better idea for a big incident, which is typically when you would probably be called. And what I can do is if you guys tell me it's a two and a half day classroom course. If you tell me where you want to have it and uh, when you want to have it, we can sponsor it and pay for it. Um, pay for instructors and I mean, I don't know what type of, if y'all get continuing education or if that's a part of anything, but that would be something good to have. And so this is new uncharted territory for us, but I think it's pretty exciting and um, you told me there's 30 or 40 people already signed into it. And so now the onus is upon me to get the training to you because, you know, the sooner the better. And, um, and again, um, you know, I will tell you, you don't have to be a rocket science to pass these things. That's for sure. And so, but when you come out of it, you'll have a good understanding of what the incident command system is. And, and all these acronyms, you guys have a ton of acronyms, you know, Gigabit, 
is terabytes and all that kind of stuff, you know, and so um, T1s and, you know, it's a lot of stuff that I was not familiar with until I became, came into emergency management. And, you know, let me tell you something. I've got a section that's like 50 people, engineers, GIS folks, uh, IT techs. We store terabyte upon terabyte. Of, we're in charge of all the flood maps. We have, uh, y'all ever heard of Geodetic Survey? Yeah. Geodetic Survey is in, my, is in our division. And let me just, I know this is bad, but I gotta tell you about this. This is exciting stuff to me. There's this thing called the cores. It's the Continuously Operating Reference System. We have 84 of them in North Carolina. And they receive uh, data from Russian and uh, American satellites. GPS. Right, GLONASS and GPS. And so they, they receive it and then they send it out to farmers for precision farming. And, it, and you'll be in a tractor if you're signed in, if you bought a license with us, and you're a farmer with a big farm, it will tell you how many seeds to put in the furrow, where exactly to put the furrow, and how much fertilizer to put in that furrow for maximum yield of crop. And so uh, I said, well, how much an acre? I asked him. I said, well, you know, sometimes it's about four or five dollars an acre. I said, well, that's not so much. But what if I got, you know, like eight, nine thousand, ten thousand acre farm? Well, wow, that adds up pretty quick. And so, uh, but to me, they also do road construction. They have, if you look sometimes and you see on the road, you see a bulldozer and it's got the two receivers on the blade and it's telling the blade go forward like that, left, right. And to me, you know, that's an example of using technology for precision purposes that is that's so powerful to me. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy that's walking around, I had no idea about that. And then my own guy, we just got this section last year. And so I said, I want you guys to brief me about what you do. And they told me, and I'm like, huh? I mean, that's, and so I have to tell that story every time. Precision farming, who knew? Okay. Get excited about it. So I've talked about what I need to talk about. So what I wanted to tell you is Chris is going to talk a little bit now. Yeah. So uh, basically, we look at, and some of you already heard our last year uh, concept of um, creating those strike teams. But how effective are you when you go in the field? Let's say GIS folks that don't have your uh, local GIS data. Um, I had one experience in Lee County. Um, uh, tornado took place on Saturday, and Monday morning I was uh, asked to come and assist. And the first thing is, you know, how can I get the local data? Well, you can go to NC One Map, start downloading, or you can, you know, their their government was under distress. They were trying to respond to whatever they were trying to respond, and the emergency management needed assistance in their command center. So they asked. We need to come in and uh, help them out. And the uh, first thing, you know, how can I get the data? Fortunately, I had a cell phone in my neighbor, uh, called JS, Nick would be a member, you know, called him up and said, hey, how can I get that? He said, hey, I'm in the courthouse dealing with this issue. I'm sending someone else with a CD with data. Well, you may not be that lucky. Next stop. So, and this was a real event. I mean, there were people that died in, in this event. So, um, we were looking at asking emergency management to provide a service to us to offer a free backup. So I don't care whether you're Catawba County or City of Jacksonville that has millions of dollars. Or <laughs> <laughs> Jones County that doesn't have any, any dollars. You have the equal access to backup. So you can basically request a secure FTP, upload and download from emergency management. They'll provide you a space that you need and on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, whatever you choose, you know, I encourage you to do it at least on a monthly basis. Basically take your data on, you know, upload to a secure server and only emergency management and your folks have access to it. It's not public information. So if you have hazmat sites, if you have some 
uh, gas lines, if you have some whatever else you have in your GIS data layers or you know whatever other data layers that you want to have available, you can put it on their servers. And guess what? They don't charge us for that. And I believe we have understanding that they won't be charging us for that service in the future. Now they will be able to use that on their side as emergency management in Raleigh. So you will be looking at the same data. So let's say I used to be in Moore County. In Moore County would be affected. Um, I'm not available. Well, whoever is responder, you know, guys from different counties, they would be basically selected by Mikujiza. We have our own committee and sent to Mike's people. And then uh, before you actually leave your city or county, you will have access to log in to their secure FTP and download all the data. And I'll tell you, I was, uh, I was present at two events. One was actual event in Lee County, and the other one was training exercise. And um, the training exercise, it was rainy. We were in a tent. Um, we were about uh, two inches of water, all the electrical wires everywhere, and we were making mud. Now, we quickly found out that inkjet printers don't work in a high humidity. Paper saturates, and much out of luck. And then you have those people that are going in the field and they're searching for alive people or for bodies, and you're supposed to make those kind of a search maps for them. Uh, we also, I'll tell you another thing, not from GIS but from IT, when we went to Lee County, um, they were pretty pretty desperate. I mean, they were they were looking for alive people, they were looking for bodies, they were, they had people uh, shopping at Lowe's when Lowe's ceased to exist. <laughs> so there was law enforcement officers aiming at those people that were trying to do shopping. Uh, and, and so we were, we were basically trying to build everything because the only thing I brought with me was basically a laptop. So I called my uh, another colleague, IT director from Lee County, and, and I said, hey, you know, listen, I need a plotter. And he said, I have it on the back of the pickup truck. I'll be there in 15 minutes. So we need IT, we need GIS folks. There are simple things like, you know, networking, voice over IP, uh, you know, whatever else to assist those guys. And I can tell you that since then, I uh, also went to uh, uh, Evansburg, Maryland, and they had basically a, a week-long situation when they ran scenarios with hurricanes and uh, flood and all other things. And you're exposed to all sorts of requests. Just when you think you've got everything figured out, chicken truck falls over or you know fuel trucks fall over and the main highway is off and you're rerouting the traffic and so uh, this concept of creating a mutual aid, A, we, we are insured through mutual aid, all hundred counties in the state participate in that. What I was told, not all the cities participate in mutual mutual uh, aid agreement in North Carolina, but most of the cities participate in mutual aid. And uh, plus on the other side, now I'm in Jacksonville, so if we need help and I'm not available, uh, we will be asking you guys to come in and help, you know, on the coast or, you know, in the Piedmont. So we need people throughout the state and we basically will have access to equipment. We'll, we need some, some basic equipment like laptops and you know, printers and MiFi devices that Mike was talking about, but we have such a strong community, the Nikogiza community, and it happens now also to be in the training. Um, and from my experience, I'll tell you that if we host class at one of the local sites and I need 15 laptops, I don't even send it to the listener. I pick up the call, the phone calls someone in that region, and they say, hey, you got it. So I don't think we'll have issues with equipment. I don't think we'll have issues with you know, resources. What I would like you to do is to basically sign up so we have a defined list. Like Mike said, we have 30, 40 people right now, but we don't know how many people we'll need. It may be a week-long event, it may be two weeks event. Plus, on the other side, we're looking at, uh, at this, those teams from the Rico Giza side as, as a source of possibly helping other jurisdictions outside of the crisis. So we had a situation in Polk County. I don't know how many people saw the situation where IT directors said, hey, you know, we're dealing with fire 
Sometimes we're a little behind, can you ask for help? Gray Coons, Gay Coons, will be on private plane. He was there within minutes to assist them with uh, fighting with that. So uh, I think it will help us all. It will organize us better. And plus, it will be a huge benefit to be prepared of what's our role, what to expect, who we report to. Because quite frankly, the reason I met Mike is because I was a little lost. And I went to the tent where you we were drinking coffee and we started talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we started talking about Poland and World War II, and then you know, I kind of tagged along with him and looked at what he was doing and pretty interesting guy, you know, and so one thing led to another. Just five minutes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's all I have. Is there anything that you guys want to ask anybody that uh, is concerned about anything? I'm, I'm concerned. I just want to say this is wonderful what you're doing in Catawba County. We have a mobile command post and we have equipped with satellites, modern laptops, radios, whatever. And we've had to deploy it before to go help other counties. There was a Boy Scout lost and we had to deploy it for that and different things and heck and I, that's one of our projects that we've always worked on. But it, it is wonderful and, and you know a lot of times you don't know what your neighboring counties or other the people other people in the state have. Yeah, they have nothing yeah. until you get there. And so it, it is, it's great when you can pull up the bus and have, you know, at least get things started so you can communicate. And without, I mean, that Boy Scout, without being able to plot that big map and be able to start your search radius or whatever, right. I mean, you know, that was, that was just huge. I'll, I'll tell you something, <clears throat> what you just said. When, when, we, when we started in, in Lee County, we were kind of a little, I guess, not ready to deal with something. And they said, well, the first thing we need to do is to send people in the field and basically look what type of, what scale of disaster are we dealing with. So they send those appraised people or assessment teams. Right. Well, if you look at, you know, if you drive by, you know, on the roads and you are in non familiar territory, you basically came in to volunteer and you're driving a car and looking at the damage, right? There used to be a mobile home. What's your assessment is going to be? Well, hey, there's no damage, right? You don't know that there used to be a mobile right. home. So what we did, we actually called our vendor, area photography vendor, which now I'm going to call Mike and say, send me one of your helicopters so we can take pictures and basically compare in the office imagery. I can send it to the listserv or I can, hey, I can say FTP size here, pull two images and just review two images at the same time. And... Uh, we printed out forms, damage assessment forms, and we had four, eight teams. All those teams came in with forms, and I got a stack of this much, and they said, we need the database now. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so I contacted my buddy in another county, and I said, do you have 20 people? He said, yeah, I'm in a DSS in the tax office. I said, okay, okay, I'm sending you so, so many PDFs. <laughs> Put it on a coffee machine, and they just started scanning and emailing those those PDFs to those people. They created Excel spreadsheets, sent it back within two hours. We had a database. Your folks were there in Lee County, and they were like, "We've never seen that before." We didn't do that. We didn't do it in Lee County because a we had one table, three guys sitting at the table. B it was a stack this this tall of forms. So having our listserv and having basically unlimited resources at the other local go governments, you can help us without even being deployed. We can ask you, hey, can you assist us with something? Data entry, analysis, imagery comparison. Uh, there's so many possibilities that we can work together that, uh, you know, it's scale. So, anyway, thank you for your comment. That, that, you know, that's awesome. And I have heard that story. That's a good story. Uh, you know, because I can tell you during that damage assessment, process, it can get bogged down pretty quick. I mean, so we, we dealt with things like Walmart brought us a semi with water and we didn't have a forklift to unload it. How do you deal with a semi full of bottled water that the company is donating to, and you know, the big company we didn't have forklift, so they, they brought a forklift from another trailer to just unload it. And then, you know, the, so the, the safety uh, situation with people trying to steal stuff, that was another thing. And plus, uh, when we found the area photography, we had a promise to get that area photography within 
few hours. It takes two hours for the plane to fly from Ohio to take the imagery. And they said by the same, the same day, we'll get the imagery. And what happened when the plane was in the air, we contacted Wake County, Halifax, and Wilson. And all four said, we need the imagery too. So we, we actually got the imagery the next day. It was a raw imagery. It wasn't you know, exactly precise. But you can take your area of photography before the event and after the event. And we actually mark not only the path of destruction, but also the buildings that have to be visited, where they cease to exist, where you saw the mobile home or you know, actually homes, physically murdered, destroyed homes. And one guy watching the perfect storm on TV that's a nice sound we have in the building. It's the neighbor's house that's <laughs> being removed. So we saw it on the imagery. It was incredible where you see development. All of a sudden, like a, you cut with a knife, remove those houses out of the you know, development. So anyway, it's exciting. Well, I'd just like to thank you for your interest. And uh, I'd like to say one other thing. You know, uh, we are building that system where counties can store their data. We are changing all of our flood maps into digital maps. And um, we've got about two-thirds of them done now, and the rest of them will be done this summer. And so the way it was, it's been explained to me is that whenever there's a change in the maps, it'll automatically update. It'll update. Whenever you change it, it updates. My question to John Dorman, who's my map guy, was I thought that flood maps had to be approved by the counties and stuff. And so, anyway, they're working through that right now because if, if the change comes from you, it should be, that should be the sign of approval to me. But we're working through some red tape. Well, there's, there's actually, I'll tell you some experience on the on, on flood map. So we had a, a, a gated community, pretty exclusive gated community that appealed the flood plain data, and they actually took it to court and they won, right? But we never got that information from flood plain mapping that the information was altered until one of the residents said, hey, I'm not paying flood insurance, but your map is still showing that I'm in a flood plain. So we contacted NC flood plain mapping and they said, yeah, we changed the data, here's the new data set. With this new system, you won't have to worry about. It. You log into the database, and John Dorman and his staff is actually giving you all statewide layers, like the, the latest, greatest area photography data, like the you know all the emergency uh, management res response data. Uh, you can get flat plane data, elevation for structure. They have a, um, in the, especially in the flood situations, they have a first floor elevation. First floor elevations so for all structures over 800 square feet. Millions. I think it's like five point. Well, my house doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's between uh, 800 square feet and 7,000 square feet since yours is the 8,000 square feet. That's <laughs> <laughs> not yet, Mike, I'm working on. But, uh, you know, so if you know what the, what the elevation of water has changed, you can add that and basically look at all the structures that could be affected without imagery. You know, kind of working in GIS for, you know, over 10 years, I'll tell you from my experience, during the event, you're kind of blind. You're sitting, you know, one ear to the radio, one ear to the reporting, whoever it's at EOC reporting, and they're telling you, we hear that the, we spotted a tornado at one location, you know where the location is on the map, but then the next call comes in, the location is moving, and or you assume the tornado has moved, or there are two independent events. Yes. So you know, going through those scenarios, taking classes, it helps you understand the expectations, anything that can go wrong, or at least a lot of things that can go wrong, and what's your role in that event. And it's really empowering when you finish the 12-hour shift or whatever, and accomplish goal, and possibly you know, a few minutes earlier reported, responded to somebody who was still found alive in that rubble. You know. Well, my, what I owe y'all is the instructions on how to get to the training. Well, we have a website. Right, um, and I owe y'all uh, instructions for the FTP site. And, and believe me, we want to show you the work of it. 
what it's worth to you because frankly it's good for us too it's good business we're sharing information so i'll make sure that chris gets that and then you can log into the website Website, you go to New Scene events and below the, you find you know all the classes that we offer. So if you're planning your uh, professional development budget in your organization or planning where you want to go this year, you have the $800 five-day course classes for New Horizon. Uh, the last stop here is uh, the registration. So you put your name, you put your email, best cell phone number that we can contact you. What type of skill set can you offer to to the organization? And then what you will receive from us is basically, hey, we need you to take one class, two class, three class. And once we have 30 people that completed those prerequisite classes, then I'll request some money from Mike to pay for our class. I really would like to do it in your facility in Raleigh because it's a center location for North Carolina. Plus, we have a heck of a cafeteria. <laughs> three bucks. <laughs> I paid, I paid for lunch for what, 12 people, 13 people, and it was like 40 bucks. It's pretty good. And I had like, uh, what, steak or something? He had like, he had like two entrees. <laughs> so I'm also 220. <laughs> Quote 220. Yeah, but also there's, there's the barbershop. Yeah. We, have, we have a barbershop, we have a PX, we have a gym. I've never seen a gym before. <laughs> But anyway, I think that would be the best location. So if we have 30, you know, people, we will ask you to put together the two and a half day events. I'll also ask Nicole Giza to possibly sponsor some help on uh, maybe throw in some lunches, maybe travel money or help with hotel. I can help with that too. Okay. So you see that that's not just on your organization. That's that's basically in a mutual interest for an entire state. Um, just briefly, I'm also working on another thing with another agency, it's an NCMC, the fiber rings around the state, to possibly allow cities and counties to tap in. And if I have a data center and I have three racks that are empty, I can say, hey, you want to put your equipment as a backup, and I'll ask you for the same thing at your location, so I'll offer you a location in Hurricane Alley. Uh, <laughs> in return, I can put my equipment somewhere else. So if you don't have any questions, that's all we've got today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mike.